Welcome everyone. This is the meeting of the Northampton Board of Health. Today is Thursday, March 10th, 2022. It is 5.31 p.m. And uh, we'll start with a public comment session. Uh, as many of you know, um, <clears throat> we allow uh, public comment and we invite public comment. Uh, everyone has two minutes to speak. And we certainly will let you finish your sentence or your thought. Um, but at the two minute mark, you'll, you'll hear from Dr. Smith and I'll ask you to wrap up. Um, you don't have your videos on tonight. Um, so if you do want to speak, please raise your hand, your electronic hand that's in the reactions button. Uh, the meeting is being recorded. Um, and the way this works is that this is not a dialogue session. Um, um, but you're free to, um, to speak, um, but uh, don't expect us to, to engage um, in dialogue, but uh, we do want to hear um, your opinions. Um, after everyone has had a chance to speak, we will close the public comment session um, and then start our business meeting. Uh, the public is not invited to uh, comment during our business meeting. So this is the time for you to, um, to say what you have to say. Um, but you are always welcome to write to the Board of Health, to the Department of Health through the um, city website, um, or to call the uh, Department of Health. Um, let's see. Um, so for tonight, uh, we have all of our board members here. We have um, Dr. Laurent Levy, uh, Dr. Suzanne Smith, Dr. Cynthia Swopis, Dr. Joanne Levin, that's myself. And we have our staff, Director Meredith O'Leary, our clerk, uh, Kelly Constantine, our assistant director, Amy Hutchins, and our nurse, Vivian Franklin. Did I miss anyone? Um, I think we still have a couple of people coming in. And I see five hands up. Um, okay, I think we'll start our public comments session now. Uh, Patrick, you can unmute. All right, good evening, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, thank you. Um, my name is Patrick Bowen. I live at Nine Hill Street in Florence. My son attends Leeds Elementary School. Um, I submitted a longer public comment addressing the petition that was um, circulated in Northampton. I'm gonna to speak to a different comment tonight. I'm asking the board tonight to finally take action to end the mask mandate in all of Northampton effective immediately. Um, listening to the discussion at the last meeting, I was disturbed to find how solely focused the board is on COVID at this point. And the director O'Leary had made a recommendation and at no point in the conversation was any aspect of people's lives outside of COVID considered. I find this unhealthy and I'd like it to end. Um, the board continues to focus energy on non-pharmaceutical interventions from 2020 before we had tools like vaccines. And I feel that every moment we spend on MPIs with question questionable efficacy, like masking this time, we're not spending on increasing vaccine rates among the, among the elderly and getting more boosters into nursing homes, a strategy that would have enormous effect on hospitalization rates. And even if mask mandates are effective, does the board believe that indefinite masking is going to lead to high compliance or increased trust in public health? Um, given that the CDC, the CDC's peer agencies in Europe, the Mass DPH, and countless other, other board of health from across the state have taken act, action to recommend, recommend the end to mask mandates, I believe that the board in Northampton should take the same action if the board were to continue to have a mass mandate beyond today, it would have to be justified based on additional data that would contradict the recommendations of all those public health bodies. I don't think that that data is, exists. Um, at this point, the only portion of the population that's forced to mass the most are service workers and students. In other words, the people with the, with, with the least power to push back. The segregation is created by who is the most and least impacted by these rules should bother you, it bothers me. I ask the board to vote to end mass mandates tonight in Northampton. And since there's no significant changes in metrics or tools coming the next few days or week, that I ask that you end it effective immediately rather than set for a future date. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. <clears throat> 
Uh, Gary and Candice. Just Gary. Um, I want to take the opportunity to first thank the board <laughs> so very, very much for your dedication and very hard and, of course, very difficult work that you've been doing. Um, it's very admirable, and I personally greatly appreciate it. Uh, I want to make two comments, one relative to the Senior Center. I, I see that uh, it is on the agenda. Uh, I personally greatly appreciate the, the vaccination mandate there, um, and I hope that nothing has changed about that because we seniors are still just as vulnerable. Um, I've had several people contact me since I posted this meeting um, saying, you know, please do not take away the vaccine mandate to, at the senior center. And, and I would like to add that um, if the mask mandate were to be removed, give the senior center some more time. Again, this is our most vulnerable population. Um, if the US government, and I don't mean to contradict what Patrick just said, but if the US government announced today that they were not going to remove the mass mandates from the airlines and public transportation, um, I don't think that we should be removing it here in Northampton from the senior center. Um, and my final little comment is, is relative to schools. Um, I have a grandson who came down with COVID this week. Um, he lives in the UK. And I think that's a great example of where we could go if we go too fast overboard. Um, he's the first direct member of my family to have COVID. Um, everybody's been very, very cautious. Uh, but in the UK, they went away from masks. Right. And even though he's 11, uh, they don't have vaccines there yet. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Karen Foster. Hi there, um, I'm Karen Foster. I'm the Ward 2 City Councilor. Um, and I wanted to start similar to Gary, actually, and just thank you so very much for your service. Um, the Board of Health, you have been at the forefront of some of the most challenging conversations we've had in our community. And I'm so grateful for you using your expertise and your time um, it, to benefit this community. Um, and I know that at the end of the day, we're all just people doing the very best we can for this um, community that we care so much about. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, as you consider the mask mandates today, I really just um, wanted to comment more on national rhetoric that I, I hope we can change locally. And that's just really, kind of a dismissal of the concerns of people who are immuno immunocompromised and children under the age of five who are not eligible um, for vaccination. You know, it's the, the upheaval um, of daycare closures and parents missing work and, you know, the, the fear of, of viruses that lay latent. It's, those are all real concerns. And I'm, and I'm not saying that that's going to necessarily change any decisions you make tonight, but just to um, keep that in the forefront um, as deliberations go on. Um, and then I, I guess this is just a, a request for the future, not for tonight, but it would be great to know what kind of metrics we may be able to consider moving forward as a community. Um, you know, if, if we do end the mask mandate, um, so we had a sense of, you know, if there's another surge, when they would come back on, when they would come back off. And, and I don't know if that data is even readily discernible yet, um, but just something that would be really, really great um, to look toward in the future. And again, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, someone with a letter A. Hi, that's me. I'm Annie Kleeman. Um, I do not live in Northampton. I live in Belchertown. Um, but Northampton has been a source of socialization and vibrancy in my life for over 10 years. Um, I love this town. Um, and I'm here tonight to ask the Board of Health to revoke the current mask mandate and restore a sense of normalcy to a unique community that is powered and enriched by social and cultural experiences that we have sorely lacked for two years. This is a time when vaccines are readily available and one-way masking using high quality masks offers additional protection for the vulnerable. It is time to move beyond mandated non-pharmaceutical interventions as we enter the endemic phase of COVID-19. Business owners and service industry employees have had the burden of mask enforcement for far too long. In fact, they should never have been asked to take up the burden of enforcement at all. 
And in the mask mandate, we'll follow the actions of communities from New York City to Boston to San Francisco and around the country. With Northampton's incredibly high vaccine uptake, the time is now to end this policy. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Uh, Joshua? Hi there. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Uh, so my name is Joshua Yearsley, and uh, I live at 292 and a half South Street. Um, so uh, first, I strongly support the end of the mask mandate in Northampton. Uh, but tonight, I want to focus a bit more on the future, because as we all know, whether or not a new variant emerges, someday we will have another pandemic. Uh, one of the best ways to prepare for this future is by improving our city's indoor air quality. Along with vaccination, air ventilation and filtration should be treated as a first line of defense against airborne illnesses, as well as an important tool in preventing lung disease, heart disease, and cancer. In America, we've expected safe tap water for nearly a century. We've expected safe outdoor air for decades. So we must demand safer in indoor air now. And I'd like to suggest a couple of ways that you can help. First, we should educate people. Just as the health department set up pop-up tables for vaccines and masks at Pulaski Park, we can do the same for air quality. Tell people about the value of opening windows and exterior doors. Explain that vented kitchen hoods and HEPA filters are great ways to clean the air in their homes. For people who can't afford these things, show them how to build effective alternatives, such as Corsi Rosenthal boxes. Second, we should collaborate with businesses to improve indoor air quality. Soon, the federal government will release the Clean Air in Buildings Checklist, which we can distribute to interested businesses. Because air quality improvements are often invisible, we can create a set of recognizable signs and stickers that businesses can use to tout their improvements and show that they care about their customers' health. At minimum, we should encourage businesses to remove the plexiglass barriers that they put up early in the pandemic. We know that COVID is primarily an airborne illness and some studies have options. Yep. Sorry. What happened? Um, looks Sorry. like I got muted. Okay, you can I finish. Um, okay. Suzanne, does he still have time? 10 seconds. OK. OK. Uh, finally, we should call on the city to allocate money for air, air quality grants. Thankfully, the city has committed significant money in its capital improvement plan toward upgrading the HVAC systems of schools and public buildings. But we must extend this to our homes, businesses, and especially our nursing homes and congregate care settings where our most vulnerable city, uh, citizens live. Let me emphasize that the political will is here. Councillors Perry and Gore have uh, mentioned that in improving indoor air quality is important. I hope you'll take these suggestions into account and I'm happy to volunteer my time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Aaron? Hello, thank you for your time. My name is Aaron Stuppel. I'm a practicing doctor. I take care of COVID patients in the hospital. I'm also a father of three children under the age of five, one of them in a local school. And I'm talking to you today because of my concern about restrictions on children. Um, I just wanted to share a few facts for context. Um, all of these are taken straight from the CDC website. Um, the number of COVID deaths in children under age of 18 is 433 per year. That's one in 170,000. Unfortunately, tr each death is tra tragic, but they are quite rare. Um, for comparison, traffic deaths took 1,053 children's lives in 2019. So more than double. Um, and there's more to disease than just death. Of course, um, we look at long COVID symptoms, but you know, traffic, Accidents also include injuries. Um, there's 183,000 traffic injuries in children in 2019. Um, seasonal flu took 526 lives among children in 2018 and 2019. Um, so more deaths due to flu than to due to COVID in a single year. Um, respiratory syncytial virus, one to 500 children under the age of five. Um, so please consider that we don't use masks to prevent RSV or flu. We don't require negative screening tests for these diseases, even though they have comparable mortality. 
And we don't ban cars because we know that the harm to children from banning cars vastly outweighs the benefit. I, I strongly believe that there is emotional harm to masking and restrictions on children. The, the face is how is the tool we use to connect emotionally with others. One simple way to quantify the emotional harm is to jump in uh, suicide attempts that the CDC has logged for 2021. Uh, over 100 uh, extra presentations to the emergency room per week in the beginning of 2021. I hope that we don't reinstate right. mask mandates in the future as this these cases will certainly spike as the virus continues to circulate. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Amanda? Amanda, you can go ahead. Hi, my name is Amanda Westlake. I am a internist. I'm a primary care doctor at a community health center in Springfield. I'm also an infectious disease specialist at Bay State, and I've been primarily focusing on COVID since the start of the pandemic. And I'm sharing my perspective today as a physician and also as a mother of three. So I do support the CDC and many of the stances that they have taken. And in fact, I did my infectious disease training at Mass General Hospital where Rochelle Walensky was my attending and I have great respect for her and for public health colleagues. However, I do feel that children have been the victims of our COVID-19 public health policy. And while children thankfully have incredibly low risk of severe disease due to COVID, they have borne a disproportionate burden of pandemic restrictions. And so I'm adding my voice to those of others to ask the board to revoke the mask mandate in schools, not only now in this moment that COVID cases are quite low, but also that the board not reinstate mask mandates in a future moment when COVID cases invariably rise again. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Uh, someone's box just says iPhone. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Todd Alexander. I live in West Hampton, but my son attends Smith Vocational High School in Northampton. I spoke at the last meeting, um, encouraging the board to end the mask mandate and I heard a lot of good arguments this evening from um, experts right from our own community healthcare providers that support that um, choice in the schools. So I'm not gonna um, you know, say a lot. I've heard a lot of good comments already. I just wanna add my voice that I encourage you to consider ending the mask mandate. The uh, social, emotional, and mental health is very important for our children and that those been a significant increase in, in those cases. So we need to um, you know, do the best we can for our kids and end this mandate. And I agree that it should never be something that can be instituted again, even if these numbers climb, we need to learn how to live with this. There's certain measures that are in place now that we did not have at the beginning of the pandemic. And really what it comes down to now is just a, a choice. It's not a big ask. People that have been waiting just want a choice. Um, the people that choose not to um, take their masks off, that's fine. We know we can respect each other's choices and learn how to live with the pandemic and, and move forward. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, Kevin. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, uh, I'm Kevin Mackey. I'm a resident in Florence, and I'd like to echo the sentiments of Patrick, Annie, Joshua, Aaron, Amanda, and Todd, that I believe the mask mandates should be ended and uh, should not come back. I still, I also believe that it's detrimental to the children's health and their development. I'd also like to um, share a legal point of view on this. Um, 
I'm actually going to cite a Supreme Court case from 2020 that dealt with these the restrictions of the COVID-19. And I quote, for months now, states and their subdivisions have responded to the pandemic by imposing unprecedented restrictions on personal liberty, including the free exercise of religion. This initial response was understandable. In times of crisis, public officials must respond quickly and decisively to, to evolving and uncertain situations. At the dawn of an emergency and the opening days of the COVID-19 outbreak plainly qualify, public officials may not be able to craft precisely tailored rules. Time, information, and expertise may be in short supply, and those responsible for enforcement may lack the resources needed to administer rules that draw fine line distinctions, fine distinctions. Such, thus at the outset of an emergency, it may be appropriate for courts to tolerate very blunt rules. In general, that is what has happened thus far during the COVID-19 pandemic but a public health emergency does not give governors and other public officials carte blanche to disregard the constitution for as long as the medical problem persists. As more medical and scientific evidence becomes available and as states have time to craft policies in light of that evidence, court sh courts should expect policies that more carefully account for constitutional rights. And that's the end of my quote. And that was back in 2020, that's they were fine. already they were saying that this is 2022. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Isabel. Hi. Um, I so far have basically echoed everything that the people who would like the mask mandate to drop. Um, I am pro vaccine, pro mask for protection, but it's now two years and I feel as if um, Basically, the vaccine availability and rates are high enough and the hospitalizations and deaths are low enough that we should be given an option to not wear a mask. I know the schools won't drop it until the town drops it. And I think for me, who I have a child in uh, preschool, she's going into kindergarten next year, that is a really big issue. Um, Basically, I don't want to live in fear. If hospitalizations are low enough, then I think we should be able to start learning to live with this as if it were the flu. Obviously, we can always reinstate the mass if the numbers go up, but I basically echo everything everyone else has said. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, I see Adrian. Before you start, Adrian. Um, I'm just gonna remind everyone, maybe some latecomers that we're in the public comment session now. If you would like to participate in public comment, please raise your electronic hand that is found in the reactions section. Oh, not, at the very end of the list. Um, okay, Adrian, go ahead, please. Hi, um, I wanna echo several of the last most recent commenters um, in in arguing strongly that it's time to drop the mask mandate, both in general in the in for indoor activities in Northampton and also for in the schools, I particularly want to thank uh, Dr. Stuppel and Dr. Westlake for speaking up. Um, as as uh, physicians, their voices carry, I think, particular weight in our community, as they would in any community. And I want to echo something in particular that Dr. Westlake said which was that we, we need to find a way uh, to make sure that as the, 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 the case uh, rate wane, waxes and wanes in the future, as surely it will, we do not return to this state again of mandating masks and in particular mandating masks for children. Um, the, as the data has continued to come in both from the United States and from around the world, it's become increasingly clear that the policy of mandating masks for children in schools has done no good. It has done no good anywhere. Um, there are unfortunately no fully randomized controlled trials, but the observational data and quasi-experimental data from all around the world has indicated that this policy has done no good. Um, so even as cases rise again, we as a community should make a commitment to ourselves that we will not reinforce this policy, which is undoubtedly detrimental to children, particularly to children with 
um, challenges related to speech delay or dyslexia or who are children who are hard of hearing or children with other uh, developmental delays. Um, this is really a catastrophe for those children. And we need to commit that we will not do this again. I mean, it's clear that we're gonna drop this mandate soon, but we need to not have a policy of reinforce, of, of reinstituting this mandate every time the case rates go up. So I thank Dr. Westlake for making that point. I think it's a very important point. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mark? Uh, hi, uh, I'm Mark Buey. I'm a resident of Florence and I have a four-year-old daughter who's in preschool here in Northampton. And, um, I, you know, I wanna echo a lot of what's being said here. Um, this virus has been least dangerous to young children. Um, and yet we've been most restrictive uh, to young children in many ways. Um, and I particularly am concerned about what some towns and cities are doing where they're dropping mask mandates, but keeping them in schools. Um, and I just feel like that's very unfair to the children um, who need to experience positive uh, experiences at school. They need to see their teachers and their friends smile, um, many of whom they may not have seen their faces of. Um, you know, my daughter now has spent mm, the majority of her life during the pandemic. Um, and it's, uh, I'm, I'm concerned. Um, and I feel like uh, the risk to her is low and the risk of spread among children is low. Um, it's not zero, but it's low enough that I think we need to prioritize uh, the well being of the children and their ability to become emotional uh, social citizens. Um, that's very difficult for them to do while wearing a mask. Uh, and that we're at a point in this. Um, in this pandemic that the drawbacks seem to be outweighing the benefits of the masks. I know in Europe, you know, they never did uh, require masks for, for, children, for young children. Um, so hopefully we, um, you know, don't do that anymore here as well. Thank you. Um, Willa. Hi, okay, so I'm here today asking you to drop the mask mandates effectively or like immediately. Um, I am pro masking, I am pro vaccine. Um, I'm not asking you to like say that masks should be banned entirely. Like obviously people still have the choice to wear them if they want, but it just doesn't make sense to have a mask mandate anymore. Cities across Massachusetts and the country have been dropping their mask mandates and places like Boston, LA, um, Philadelphia, all have greater population than Northampton and they seem to be fine with it. Um, and with surrounding cities already having no mask mandate, there's nothing stopping, from, stopping anyone from traveling to surrounding towns, um, going to work, going to get dinner, and then coming back um, and then having to put on a mask to, you know, go to the grocery store and get a bunch of grapes. Um, and it's kind of ridiculous because we've been able to take our masks off for two years now to eat. And then we have to put them back on if we want to go to the bathroom, but there's nothing stop it. It doesn't make sense because, you know, how is, it, it just doesn't make sense because, you know, COVID's not going to stop if you're eating and then like put a mask on to go to the bathroom, you know? Um, and people, there's still access to, to vaccines, that's free. Um, there's, a, you know, you can get one almost anywhere now. Um, and you really can't stop people from seeing each other at this point. Most people feel safe and I, I really think that it, it's time to end everything um, once and for all. So thank you for hearing me out. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to speak? Uh, public comment. I see one more hand up. Uh, this is the time for anyone who'd like to speak to the board 
to put up your electronic hand, which is found in the reaction section. Um, and when the public comment session is over, we will close the public comment session and go into our business meeting where there will not be any dialogue. So this is your chance to <clears throat> speak up if you'd like to speak to the board. Um, Michael? Hi, I, I'm Michael Phylus and I live in Northampton. I have two kids at the high school and I agree with uh, what people are saying about it's time to end the mask mandate. I do disagree uh, with those that have commented that masks haven't done any good. I think that there's, there's a lot of um, scientific consensus that they have helped and I would discourage you from um, making any decision about not returning to masks should they be necessary as sympathetic as I am to all of us who have had kids whose social development and academic development have been affected by um, by the the imposition that masks make upon their relating to um, their peers and their teachers and just socialization in general. So um, thank you for for that. I just wanted to to put out a, a voice that uh, just to be clear that I do think masks have worked and I'm. Uh, my two kids in high school, they're, they're ready on their own. Uh, we haven't really talked about it, but they've both said that they'd, they'll probably wear their masks. But I suspect, for example, in the high school, if the mask mandate drops, that most of the kids, a majority of the kids will stop wearing them and it will, it will go away. But I agree with the last speaker who said, who commented that in surrounding towns and in restaurants, it's, it, seems, it seems like this is a time to let individuals make their choices when they're out in public. And uh, it's probably good, better for Northampton to not have the mask mandate now, but we don't know what kind of strains will come around in the future. And Omicron, my whole family got it over the holidays, even though we're all vaccinated, we were able to deal with it. And there could be worse strains, but for now it seems like the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um... And Shelly. Hi, my name is Shelly Fournier and I'm a resident in East Hampton, but work in Northampton. And would just also like to voice my opinion that we would like to be mask optional. And also that the Board of Health also please look into some of these vaccination issues that are also going on with um, Florida has recently, and so hasn't Washington state opposed child vaccination because of other issues since getting all the information and documents that were released from CDC and the FDA. Um, and that you guys just take a little bit extra time before scheduling any more vaccination clinics for the kids and maybe just look into what other states are seeing and why they're choosing to stop children vaccination as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other hands up. Last call for anyone who wants to participate in public comment. Um, raise your electronic hand, please. Anybody else? Let me look around. I don't see anyone else. All right. Um, I think we'll close our public comment session. Um, all right, would someone like to, thank you everyone who commented. Um, and I do also wanna mention um, that we did receive a number of written comments for uh, before tonight's meeting and I think we all received those. Um, and again, you are welcome to write to the Board of Health at any time through the city website. Um, and we welcome your your comments. Um, would anyone like to make a motion to uh, open the Board of Health meeting? Move to open the meeting. Thank you. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you. Do we really have to take a vote? <laughs> All in favor, Cynthia? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Lauren? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Okay, we are now, uh, it is 6.06 .06 p.m. on March 10th. Uh, this is a Northampton Board of Health meeting and um, this meeting is being recorded. Um, so first up, 
Um, we'll do a data review with Vivian. Thank you, Vivian. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Look how beautiful that is. All right. Um, so I just like to always do kind of a look back for comparison where we are now and where we were really just a few weeks ago. Um, so highlighted at the bottom is where we are now. Uh, in the past seven days, we've had a total of 14 whole cases. Um, so that's an incident rate of about seven cases per day per 100,000 people. <clears throat> And the state positivity rate today is 1.6%. So compare that to where we were just after the holidays. We had 196 cases per day per 100,000 and a state positivity rate of 23%. So we are doing phenomenally well compared to really just a couple months ago. Um, so the CDC recently uh, released these new community level metrics to help us um, better gauge where we are at with community risk, and it also factors in hospitalization as well as transmission. Um, so if you have fewer than 200 cases per 100,000, um, then you're really looking more at your hospitalization metrics. Um, once you hit 200 or more per 100,000 in the last seven days, um, then you're automatically going to be medium or high risk. And then you're going to base that risk more off of your hospitalization data. Um, so there's been a lot of hubbub that Hampshire County is the only remaining county that is at the medium risk level. And that is based just on um, transmission data, not hospitalization data. I'm happy to say that per CDC's own data, they really just have to update that map. We are, per all the data that I'm looking at, we are well overdue to change down to that low transmission. And I'll get to that maybe in the next slide. Hold on. Nope, not in the next slide. Um, but I just want to point out with the CDC data, they do a case rate per 100,000. They do um, per the whole seven days. So they don't average that out over the seven days. And I will say that that can make the data a little bit more subject to being skewed. Um, say if there's a day where, you know, many, many people test positive um, during that time frame where they did collect that data from, there was a day where in Hampshire County, there was, you know, 90 something people who tested positive. And then the rest of the days was like 30 to 40 people, but because it's not averaged out, that can then skew that data. Um, so that's just something I want to point out. And also that's a different rate um, than what the state uses when they're reporting the incident rate. And then it's a different rate than what I use when I'm reporting incident rate because I average it out over the seven days. Right, so, so this you, is additive. You take all the cases in seven days and add them together as opposed to averaging into a daily rate. Correct, they just, yeah, they too, they say, for example, um, we had 300 cases in the last seven days. They would say, how many is that per 100,000 people for the whole Hampshire County population? what we would do in Massachusetts, um, what they do at the state level and what I do locally, we divide that out over the whole seven days to get an average daily case um, count per 100,000. So when you said you had seven cases per day per 100,000, this becomes 49 cases here, right? You multiply by seven to compare that to the per 100,000 in the past seven days. You'd use seven times seven days. Yeah, or you could just take the actual total of whatever it was. Yeah, but except except it's a hundred thousand people, so you'd have to multiply by the Northampton population. Um, well, this is county data, so it would be the oh, you know, okay. sixty okay. some thousand people that live in Hampshire County that they're doing that by. But I um, I will get to our data momentarily, so we can look at that. Um, so yeah, so per our own data that I'm going to get to, we should be down to the low community level, just like the rest of the state. Um, there's just been a little bit of lag behind with the CDC and changing their map. I've been refreshing it all day. Vivian, do you wanna go ahead, just skip ahead to our data? And maybe yeah. I'll put... Okay, yeah. so this is the data as of March 8th. Um, the CDC, um, they do get 
pretty live reports from the state. Um, Massachusetts is a state that reports pretty um, rapidly compared to other states. Um, there still is a little bit of a lag, but it shouldn't be, it shouldn't make things too um, dramatically different. Um, so the CDC was reporting a seven day case count of 233 cases for all of Hampshire County. Um, granted that's reported cases, which that's not factoring in home tests. That's the caveat we should always be thinking of, but um, as it is, we had 233 cases reported um, with a seven day case rate uh, per 100,000 of 145. So that's well below that 200 per 100,000. Um, I went ahead and I did the incident rate. So that was an average of 21 cases per day per 100,000 that um, were reported. Um, new COVID positive hospitalizations. We had a grand total of four people in Hampshire County were you know, hospitalized with COVID. Um, in the last seven days, which is 2.2 per 100,000. And that's another metric when they look at hospitalizations. Um, if, it, if that hospitalizations per 100,000 is less than 10, then you're still sitting in the low. Um, our staffed inpatient beds, uh, percent staffed inpatient beds in use by patients with confirmed COVID-19 in Hampshire County was 3.3%. Um, and then I did those metrics also for Northampton. Um, we had, 14 cases, like I said, um, with 48 cases per 100,000 reported for the full seven days, and an incident rate of seven cases per day per 100,000. We've had zero new hospitalizations in the last week, which is great. Um, and then Dr. Levin and I kind of estimated what we're looking at. Just, hospitalized. Like that. You know, I can like that. All set? Yeah. <laughs> um, our percent staffed beds in use by um, patients with COVID-19 in Northampton is um, roughly 3%. That's what we calculated earlier. So a lot of data, but all pointing in great directions. Um, do you wanna go back to the metrics or finish out data? You can do more data and then we can just go back to what it all means, yep. Um, so there was a lot of question as to why uh, why Hampshire County was so much higher in transmission um, than the rest of the state. Um, I did do a little um, detective work, infectious disease detective work. Um, we had, let's see, um, of our 233 cases in the last seven days, um, I did look at higher ed. Um, so if they are tested through an institution of higher ed, then that's reported with their test result. That was only, you know, 35% of our cases were associated with Institute of Higher Ed per the test report. But then I broke down our cases by age group and you can see um, not only were the majority of Hampshire County cases over in Amherst, the majority of all of Hampshire County cases were between the ages of 18 and 22, um, which, um, is the you know typical age for a traditional higher ed student. Um, so I made some fun graphs to really you know visualize just how. Um, so that was about sixty one percent of our cases in the last seven days uh, were eighteen to twenty two years old. Thank you. They're beautiful graphs, Vivian. Anybody have any questions? Um, do you want to go back to the uh, what the different levels mean or what a green level on the CDC map um, means? Oh, oh, there's one more. Hospitalizations. Yep. Just to kind of give an overview of trends, we did have those spikes in hospitalizations and bed use here in Hampshire County. Um, you can see that we had a spike really associated with Omicron as much as people say that Omicron was more mild, there was a pretty substantial spike that we saw. Um, in hospitalizations, but that's since, you know, like our cases come sharply downward. Um, so this kind of helps you visualize that as well. So there's daily hospitals, uh, hospital admissions, but also daily percent beds used and daily ICU, uh, percent ICU beds used as well. Now, let me, any questions about that data? All right. So like I said, 
our data says that we should be in the low. I would be very shocked if we are still yellow by the end of the week. Um, but so per the low, the um, CDC has given different recommended prevention behaviors for both individuals and communities um, per what's going on in terms of their community level. Um, so for the low level, um, individuals are recommended, you know, absolutely stay up to date with their COVID-19 vaccines and boosters. We know that that is uh, one of the most valuable prevention tools we have. Uh, maintain improved ventilation throughout indoor spaces when possible. Um, follow CDC recommendations for isolation and quarantine. Um, definitely, even if masks come off, um, if you are in your isolation or quarantine period, um, you should absolutely still be wearing a mask if you're out past that strict five-day period. Um, and people who are immunocompromised or high risk for severe disease, and I'll add people who are um, who live with people who are at high risk for severe disease are also recommended to take extra precautions, um, such as having a plan for rapid testing um, if needed. And then people who are at high risk also do have some um, different medical therapies that are now available to them in addition to the vaccinations, such as antivirals, um, pre-exposure treatments, and monoclonal antibodies. Um, at the community level, um, we definitely want to continue to make sure that we are, um, you know, offering vaccination efforts, um, improving ventilation in our indoor public spaces, ensuring access to testing. And we know that in Massachusetts right now, a lot of testing sites are closing um, and ensure access and equity in vaccination and treatment. Vivian, does the absence of the word mask in both of these examples suggest anything? Or is it very I different? Would it suggest it's not deliberate? Um, I was a little surprised that somebody who's immunocompromised is told to kind of throw all caution to the wind at this point. I would say even with low transmission, it's not no transmission. Um, so somebody who's severely immunocompromised or otherwise high risk may want to consider taking that measure still. You want to show what the what the yellow? Um, As I recall, their their mm -hmm. masking is mentioned at higher levels. Yeah, it is for the for the low level. The CDC is saying that no mask is required, with the exception of a quarantine or isolation period. And then at the medium risk, and Viv, I'll let you speak to everything out. But if we just break out the masking, what it's saying per color is no requirement except Q and I in the low and then the medium uh, when it comes to masking people with health uh, health issues speak to your health care provider about masking and other precautions and then at the high level um, general public are urged to wear masks in indoor spaces so I'm just extrapolating the masking requirement for the levels I have no idea what is drawn on oh it's gone now was something drawn on my screen in yours? Yeah, yeah a little bit. <laughs> Big red line on it. Okay, well, that's gone now. That was interesting. So yeah. the middle, the second bullet point says, if you have household or social contact with someone at high risk, um, consider self-testing, consider wearing a mask when indoors. Yeah, um, that's that's the one area where I would say lower yeah. medium. If, if there's transmission going on in the community, if you're, if you're somebody who's at high risk, you are you are somebody who is at high risk. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't stop. I wouldn't personally stop taking precautions. Um, you know, as as you deem fit and as you deem fit with your provider too. Um, if your risk is high, it doesn't even say that you should wear a mask. It says talk to your healthcare provider about whether you need to wear a mask, which is sort of ludicrous because they tell they always say talk to your healthcare provider but they don't give the healthcare provider any guidance. Nope. <laughs> anyway. Uh, any questions for Vivian about the data or the CDC criteria? I just want to uh, note that um, with the Amherst data they still uh, remove their mask mandate. Yeah, and their cases are going down. Um, they're accounting for a lot of the cases, but 
the you know the the cases that they're contributing are going down as the rest of the county is going down. I think um, at least for right now, um, the colleges are beginning to reflect more and more what's going on in the general population. But for that, especially for that time period where the CDC drew the data from for their new map, um, which was February 23rd through March 1st, um, a, a good chunk of those cases were from colleges or you know college age population. Thought that was interesting. Anything else for Vivian? Um, Thank you so much, Vivian. These are awesome graphs. Yep. And I do have just an update for vaccination coverage. Really hasn't changed <coughs> that much. 80% of our population is fully vaccinated. That's 82% of our five years and older are fully vaccinated. Um, and 52% of our population has received the booster. 58% um, of our 12 years and older have received the booster. Um, and again, we have that weird uh, situation with our 16 to 29 year olds um, that we're also always kind of baffled by. Um, but that's where we are with vaccination coverage, doing pretty well, I'd say. Thank you so much. Any other questions or comments for Vivian? Awesome. Thank you, Vivian. Welcome. All right, we'll move along on our agenda. Um, old business, uh, viewing the mask order. Um, does anyone um, want to comment uh, about our current mask order, given these uh, really awesome statistics that Vivian presented to us? Um, I'm feeling good about how things are going right now. Um, any comments? Uh, my recollection is that when we met two weeks ago, there were two factors that um, persuaded us to wait another two weeks to act on this. One was to wait for the CDC guidelines and metrics, which did come out, fortunately. We have them now, very helpful. The other was to wait to see what happened after the February school break. And I think we now have the evidence that we did not have uh, a rise in cases after that school break. So um, I, I think we have the information that we need now that we did not have two weeks ago. Um, and it is notable that so many communities around us have already removed their mask mandate. Other comments? Yeah, I would, I would agree. And um, the one thing that's still swirling in my mind is this on and off, when do you go back? When do you go on and off? And, and I think um, just a conversation about that. I, I don't know if uh, it's too simplistic to say once we're in low, I'm just talking very general here. Once we're in low, we don't need masks. We move to medium for a specified period of time. Then we need masks. I, I, I'm just simplifying things, but do we have a, um, a criteria that we want to entertain or do we want to move in a direction of saying no masks for now at a particular, and then what would that particular date be? So just, just a few questions. <clears throat> I believe that even with um, medium level transmission, there's no language about mandating masks. Um, Vivian, could you put that up again to the yellow slide, please? Great, thank you. Ask your healthcare provider. <laughs> that's on an individual level, but even yes, at a community that's level. Right. Yeah. Enhanced prevention measures in high risk congregate settings. <laughs> I 
Yeah, we just have, it says to maintain improved ventilation in public indoor spaces, and we don't have that. We don't have that, it yet. <laughs> yeah, and so that seems to me, it's another thing that's hanging out there. That I think one of those public comments is that we really need to begin to address that. Yes. Could, you, could you put the high, high, high level of community transmission up, please? Because it, it talks about, um, for individuals, wear a well-fitting mask, but um, I, it just once again talks about implementing enhanced prevention measures. There's there's nothing about mask mandates that I have seen in any of these recommendations. It's more think, a, an, an emphasis on individual recognizing their own risk and um, wearing masks in response to that. Yeah, I think this was some very fancy um, language, uh, attention to language and how they, how they wrote it. You think? <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, any other comments, thoughts or comments? M Meredith, could you tell us a bit more about what will happen for schools if, if we decide to act today and lift the mandate? Uh, sure. What's the implication for the schools? Do so, the school committee need to act? Mm -hmm. So in January, the school committee voted to affirm. Nope, you're frozen. Oh, you're frozen. We'll never know. <laughs> Um, I did ask Meredith that same question. If she doesn't become unfrozen, I could tell you what I believe is the answer, is that the school committee um, made their own policy of masking. Oh, there you are, you Meredith. Me? Okay. Now you're unfrozen, go for it. Believe it or not, I'm sitting on top of a Wi-Fi extender. I have <laughs> no idea. <laughs> so yeah, in January, the school committee voted to affirm that the school committee is responsible for setting district policy. And at that time, I, they instituted a um, mask policy that's indefinite um, until it's lifted for the NPS in school and on um, transportation. There she goes again. Mm. Sounds like transportation. Yeah. <laughs> so if we were to lift the mask mandate, um, the school would still have a mask order in place per their own policy. My um, understanding. What's that? I said that's my yeah. understanding. Mm -hmm. oh, back. Meredith, you're back. Yes, I can hear you. So that's bizarre. That yeah, yeah. So if we lift, I'll keep it short. If we lift ours, they still have theirs. And would you tell us when the next uh, uh, school committee meeting is? Tonight in one minute, it starts 6.30. So whoever wants to give public comment on that school meeting, uh, who is on the call probably should uh, immediately switch to the 6.30 <laughs> meeting to particularly they have school children, they should probably find it and provide comment if they want something to be lifted. But I assume it's not on the agenda, is it? <clears throat> I do not believe it's on the agenda tonight. It'd be on the agenda for the next meeting. I think it's the end of right. the month. So it would yeah. be at the next in the next meeting, probably. Yes, I believe so. Um, but that doesn't mean they can't have, get public comment about it um, tonight. Okay. And so just to um, just to be clear, I think I know the answer to this question. If we were to lift the mass mandate. There are some entities in town, like um, the transit system. If they still have a requirement for mask, one must wear a mask. Um, or any individual business owner who wants masks in their um, in 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 their facility, they can still do that. Correct. I believe that that's true. That any facility or business can declare. Uh, admission criteria. I have not asked our um, attorney about that. I mean, if there were 
you know, a, a question of enforcement, um, how that would go. Meredith, are you aware? So what I heard in between freezing is can businesses, local businesses make their own policy regarding masks? And the answer is yes. And they would be in charge of the enforcement of that. And that goes for schools, private schools, for example, um, can make their own policies. They're still required in healthcare settings. They are still required in healthcare settings, absolutely. I don't think that's gonna be going away for- Ever. Who knows, ever, maybe. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments on this topic? Does anyone want to make a motion? Um, motion to lift the mask mandate effective immediately. Thank you, Lauren. Um, is there any, uh, is there a second? Second and, and a question as to um, effective date. Uh, mm -hmm. Meredith, don't we have to give you time to prepare something for us to sign to lift this or, or is that not true? No, that's not true, Suzanne. We can lift it effective immediately. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I do second Lauren's motion. Great, thank you. Any other discussion? Uh, just a discussion. So if we were to lift the mass mandate and we can do it immediately, at this point in time, we are not putting in any um, metric to say when it would come back on or, or address that issue at all. Is that, that's my understanding anyway. I, I think that's true at this time. I think that's a good, uh, good topic for discussion though, uh, at another time. Uh, any other comments on the motion? Uh, Meredith, do you have a recommendation? So I love what you guys, what the motion was um, to lift the mandate effective immediately. Um, I think the community needs it. Um, we received, as I provided you, many emails, many comments as to um, referencing good science, where we're at, um, the effect that it's having on mental health. Um, so I think moving in this direction is the right thing to do. I think the change in protocol for the CDC is an indicator that the nation is approaching a transition from pandemic to endemic phase and that we need to go from prevention and change our focus on monitoring for spikes of infection. Um, I agree at this point, we should not be setting a metric to put the mask mandate in place right now. Um, I think one, we need the dust to settle a little bit, but I also think as we've seen over the past two years, that metrics have changed. We always talked about setting metrics and right when we were about to, um, we, had to we had to reposition ourselves again because those metrics were not valuable. Um, so I don't think at this time that we should even be talking about what metrics to be set. To the metrics, you know, the, the metrics that the CDC set, I think will last over time. It's, it's three factors, it's very clear. It's the number of new COVID cases, it's hospital beds being used and hospital admissions. Um, I can't see that changing, but again, I think I've said that before in the past with, uh, with COVID and eventually something changes, but um, that's my opinion right now. Great. Any other comments on the motion on the table? Um, all right, we'll have a vote. All in favor, Lauren? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Motion passes. Uh, the Northampton mask mandate, mask order is now officially lifted. Thank you all. Thank you. Um, next topic of discussion, um, senior center vaccine order. Um, Meredith, do you want to sort of give a little background or any comments? 
we, you just asked to put this on the agenda. And I think as we move forward, it should be put on the agenda just as we did with the mask order, just to bring it up, talk about it. Um, there was nothing behind it at this time. Um, we received a letter from staff of the senior center um, asking us to consider lifting it. I've not heard from any of the members anything um, about their want to for it to be lifted. Um, we have a public health ambassador that is there every single day checking the vaccine status of the members. And um, I'd have to say that they seem pretty grateful that this is a mandate. Um, it has affected very few. A few people forgot their cards originally and had to go back and get one. And then I think maybe there was one or two members that didn't know about the requirement or didn't have the booster yet for one reason or another. So um, I think the overall consensus is they're really um, glad that we have this policy. Um, it's also my feeling that uh, continuing to encourage vaccination and boosting is still a priority moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, and that uh, this kind of order really encourages the elders at highest risk to do that. Um, so I, I would be in favor of keeping it for now. Any other thoughts? I'm just trying to understand the disconnect between the staff and the seniors. Any reason? I don't Why know. this letter? We don't no, know. No, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, just to clarify, Meredith, you were saying that we have provided an ambassador who's doing the checking there. So this yep. is not so this is not a burden on the staff at the senior center. Not at all. Mm -hmm. No. Nope. Well, in their letter, I think they said if the senior center increases their hours, it would be hard to fill those slots of at, at the door. Uh, I have ambassadors that are willing to work. Yeah. Any other comments? Thank you, ambassadors. What's that? I said thank you, ambassadors. Thank you, ambassadors. Yep, they're wonderful. In many ways, yes. All right. Um, just checking, do I hear a motion? Don't well, I don't think we need a motion if we're no. not doing anything. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, that's my question. Okay. Just making sure. Okay. Okay. We're ready to go on to the next topic. We're good. Um, uh, let's review our minutes from last time. Um, Kelly, can you bring them up? Yes. Thank you. Did everyone have a chance to look at them? Yes, I don't have anything to offer. Thank you, Kelly. You're welcome. Uh, let me find them. I could bring them up if you don't have them. No, I have them. I had to open them. Okay. And can you make it a little bigger? Mm -hmm. Kelly, can you take out the mm. uh, uh, stuff, <laughs> the formatting stuff? There you go. Oh, I never knew how to do that. Oh, that's good to see. Thank you. Um, great. Anybody have any um, comments about the minutes? Or you all have them? Um, Are they short enough, Cynthia? I'm, uh, I'm, I'm restraining myself, Kelly. I'm, I'm just waiting for Lauren to give his uh, little thing. I don't have anything. Whoa. Yes. <laughs> I changed that sentence. Oh. There, were, there were a couple members of the public that spoke. Are you sure this is the version that I edited? Yes. Let me look at my version. Hold on. Uh, I'll admit I procrastinated a bit. <laughs> um. Hold on, let me find my minutes. Make sure they're the same. I think that's a win, Kelly. <laughs> that is. <laughs> that is one of the best sets of minutes I've seen. 
it's concise it's formatted like a maybe just a dot instead of the a at number five <laughs> stop it <laughs> I would just change that sentence in that first little bit that says, instead of there were a couple members of the public that spoke to there are several members of the public spoke. There's several members spoke. Um, anything else? Um, is there a motion to approve? Approve uh, a move to approve the February 17, 2022 minutes as um, presented. Is there a second? I'll second. Any comments? All in favor? Cynthia? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Laurent? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Okay, minutes are approved. Um, I don't think we have anything else on our agenda. Um, uh, Meredith, do you have any updates or anything else you want to? Uh, Bring to the group. Um, well, we are ramping down our vaccination efforts. We are looking to close the Elks vaccine um, clinics come the first week of April. Um, so for the rest of March, we're going to be there on Mondays and Fridays, our normal hours. And then we're at Thorns Market on Thursdays from two to six. And then we are there again on Saturdays. And I was a little unsure of setting up shop there, if it, how, how it would be received. And I'm surprised. It surprises me every day. We do have people that sign up for it and walk-ins, people who are shopping, just come in and, and get vaccinated. So depending on what that looks like at the end of March, we will reassess. And if they, we, they still give us the space, we might still do something there periodically. Um, I imagine we'll be outdoors again. Um, we had our uh, clinic at Pulaski Park, if you all remember, in the good weather. Even when it started getting cold, we were still out there because people really got used to us being there. Um, so I think we'll probably consider doing something like that as the weather gets warmer. And in addition to that, we are going back to some of our schools. We are going out to our Northampton Housing Authority properties, uh, especially the family properties. Um, and then on a regional basis, we're reaching out to all of the Boards of Health, Council on Aging, and the eight housing authority properties in our county um, to give them an opportunity to have a clinic again. Um, so it's slow and steady, but it's, we're still having people show up at the clinic. Um, and, and at this point, I, like I've said before, every vaccine, uh, vaccine matters. So, um, so we're happy. It's, it's a win, even if we just get one or two people through the door at this point. So, um, and Vivian mentioned that the state testing sites, a good majority of them are closed are shutting down on um, the end of this month also. The only two state-run ones here in, in Western Mass are going to be in um, Springfield, not Western Mass, the three counties, Hampshire, Cam Hampshire Hamden, and Franklin. Um, but we're going to continue with the one in East Hampton, uh, which is at Mill Park that uh, East Hampton Northampton had collaborated on setting up. Um, until there is a significant, a significant drop off in numbers. Right now it's still being utilized and it might have an uptick once the state stop the spread sites in Holyoke and a variety of places um, close down. So we will continue to assess that. Bree Eichstead, mm -hmm. who is the director uh, in Northampton and Mayor LaChapelle have been very generous with um, you know, their resources over there and keeping that running. So. And he's happy to report mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Um, so I do think it's important that we continue to have local vaccination and local and easy, uh, accessible, easily accessible um, testing. Mm -hmm. So um, keeping whatever you can downtown, um, I think is really important. Yep. Yep. I agree. <laughs> I agree. Besides that, um, no, not much to to report. 
we're working. Um, <laughs> it's budget season, so we're very busy, all department heads, and putting their FY23 budget together. Um, so I have my meeting with the mayor tomorrow. Um, I have been collecting data about, um, you know, past years, our grant data. Um, we've brought in over $12 million in grants to date since I took over the health department 10 years ago, which is just amazing to me. And then fiscal year 22 alone, we have $1.5 million in grants. Um, so my, I have an amazing team. Um, not only are, you know, stellar in grant writing, but execution too. And we keep on, um, you know, we always talk about sustainability when we write these grants. I've had, you know, since my largest first grant about seven or eight years ago, I still have that staff that I hired then. So we are retaining them um, and our work is sustainable, which is, which is pretty awesome. Um, so we're busy doing that. Um, we are feeling, and the vibe is changing a little bit in the health department um, on the environmental health service side that we're no longer responding or having the need to respond to COVID complaints anymore. I mean, we've still had some, you know, a few mass complaints come in here and there. We're just kind of tying up COVID loose ends and looking forward to the future, um, going out and doing our proactive, you know, food service inspections. They, you know, by, by mass general law, we're mandated to get to them at least twice a year. And during COVID times, we weren't able to do that because we were so busy with COVID response efforts. So I think as a team, um, you know, with uh, with the days getting longer, being brighter out at the end of the day, I feel like we too are, re you know, being reinvigorated with this next new chapter. I'm not saying that COVID, you know, we're, is done or it's going away. I just feel this huge seismic shift in our work plan over the next couple of months, which is super refreshing because um, there was a lot of burnout and I, I didn't know how much longer we could go at the rate and levels that we were going at. So um, I feel just like my, my entire staff has this kind of, are re-energized and it's nice. It's nice to be there mm -hmm. watching this transition. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. Cynthia? Um, if I could ask Meredith, um, based on us uh, eliminating the mask mandate, there's several restaurants in town that still have, you know, um, isolated seating, social distance seating. Um, would would this signal to them that they're at 100% occupancy again? Yeah, they've been at, uh, they've been able to be at 100% occupancy for a while now. Um, I, I do fear that, you know, not here just in Northampton or Hampshire County, but nationally with everyone lifting these mask mandates that it's a signal that, you know, COVID is over and it's certainly not. I mean, we are still having more cases now than we did when we implemented a lot of our public health intervention strategies. So it's still here. People still need to take precautions, but you have to do it at what you're comfortable with. Um, we do have, you know, obviously vaccine and medications and, and other things at our disposal that help offset severe disease. Um, but yeah, in regards do, to occupancy. Do you think we have a responsibility to do something like we did suggestions for the business businesses, the letter that we sent, that we would have a responsibility to send something that says, yes, masks are gone now, however, but. I mean, so I'm just. I, yeah, I think we have a responsibility just based off the CDC's guidance. You know, they, they did craft it um, very carefully, their language that they used. Um, to kind of give a more general um, communication about what this means, how you should modify your, your practices based on the prevalence of disease. So I think there should there could be some commonalities, you know, whether it's to a business or to the general public, what this really means moving forward, but I think it's a really good idea. I was thinking that um, 
maybe we could again uh, send a letter to the Gazette uh, explaining what we have done and why we have done it uh, as far as lifting the mask mandate and then reiterating that people can choose to wear masks if they're immune compromised or live with someone immune compromised or any time or that any business can ask uh, that people wear a mask and that you know that it's not over over and and uh, reminding people of that there, there's some other things that I think um, I would also want to remind that public um, one is about ventilation and that's more geared for um, businesses than homes, but can apply to homes as well. And the other is something that people don't really know much about, and that's that there are new oral therapies. And for people who are um, at high risk, which is anyone over a certain age, uh, as well as those with underlying conditions, that if they're symptomatic, they need to get tested promptly because those therapies have to be used within five days of symptoms. So it takes time between when you have a symptom and you decide to get tested and you decide to get tested and you get your results and then you call your healthcare provider. So that could take five days right there. Um, and I think it's really important that people know that we have really wonderful oral therapies now um, that um, a lot of people don't know about. Um, so I, I would be in favor of um, writing a letter that sort of educates the public about, yes, we've lifted the mask mandate, but you know, here are some things to really still consider. Vaccination, masking if you want to, blah, 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 all that stuff. Um, would you guys be in favor of that? Yeah, uh, definitely. And putting it on our Facebook page too. I mean, I really think we need to, I don't want to have the signal that everything is back to normal. And I think it's our responsibility to give some of these suggestions. So. All right, I can draft something. Um, okay, the other uh, question for you, Meredith, um, are we still going to be doing contact tracing? It, we contact tracing sort of stopped or the state told you to stop when the number of cases was so overwhelming. But now that the case numbers are low, are we gonna be able to do go back to contact tracing? Yeah, so they didn't tell us to stop. They told us to prioritize. Hmm. So um, we, we, definitely prioritized but we still and again in northampton we reach probably 90 percent of the people um and as a regional group collaborative i think we were about just about 80 percent what we could reach um we're still doing contact tracing in fact i just asked um our contact tracers because there's not as many cases to go back and reach out the people reach out to the people that we didn't get in contact with with so we can get their um, clinical data and their vaccination status and then we can put it back we can put it into maven which is the uh d disease surveillance database that we use i think having that information is really important um so yeah but we're still continuing we still call great 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 and one last question is um i don't know if you or amy want to give us an update last time we made these recommendations for um, restaurants and venues. They were sent out. Um, and then um, Amy was going to do a, uh, a survey. I don't know where we are with that. We'll let Amy speak to that. Hi. Um, yeah, Amy, Amy Kaylane and I kind of uh, got to a point where we were just about ready to do it. Uh, it was almost like fully prepared. And then the climate kind of changed a little bit when at the last time we met and the, the mask border didn't come down and we thought we would kind of wait and see, when, you know, we want it, we want it to be received well. So I think we can like revisit that because it is all about ventilation. And now that, mm -hmm. that they've, they've heard what you said tonight, I think it would be good, a good time now maybe to start asking those questions again. Um, Rachel, you've talked about this being budget time is this the appropriate time to mention to the mayor our um, interest in using some of the federal funding to help businesses with their ventilation improvements? Mm 
So, yep, I have mentioned it to our, um, the previous mayor and the new mayor um, to consider that ARPA funding being used for ventilation purposes for businesses. Um, so I don't know the process. I, I, I have another meeting with, you know, coming up with her that I wanted to talk a little bit about that. But I don't know what the process is for people to ask or businesses to ask for that ARPA funding or how they're going to, what it's earmarked for. So. Um, I'll bring it up, but yeah. If there's interest, I think it would be very helpful to, to make that um, known to people. Mm -hmm. to, Absolutely, to, to, yeah. Uh, uh, well ahead of time that mm -hmm. uh, the city is, if, if this moves forward, would be, would be interested in, in using funds to help businesses mm -hmm. with ventilation. I, I really would love for us to move to real to move forward with this. Um, I I don't I don't think the general businesses really know. I think they hear HVAC or ventilation, and you tend to cringe a little bit because that usually is associated with large dollars. But there are different things that you can do on the financial spectrum to have better ventilation within your business. And I think it's just getting someone in, you know, a contractor, of so an HVAC contractor, an expert on the subject to come in and talk to the, the businesses about different types of ventilation and air quality and what different filters can do. And, you know, um, I did put an email out to Joseph Allen, um, who is the specialist that came in and talked to the school committee members. Yeah, the school committee members. He did a four series um, presentation. Um, and I haven't heard back from him, but I did get one of his recorded sessions. And I'm not sure if I just sent it to Joanne or if I sent it to all of the board members. Did you receive that from me? I haven't seen it. I don't think so. Yeah. I received it, but I haven't looked at it yet. Okay. Maybe you I'll, could send that all I'll around. send that out tomorrow. He also has a website. I forgot what it's called. Harvard Healthy Homes or something like that. Um, he's really he's really good. And he uh, or he's a bunch of interviews on YouTube that are really, um, really helpful, I think. But I haven't seen one video yet that would really be targeted or, or really specific for restaurants and venues. But. I think it's important to keep in mind what a tough two years this has been for businesses mm -hmm. um, and most businesses continue to be short staffed and just as we have prioritized they have prioritized too so I, I really would hope that we could be able to give assistance um, rather than ask them mm -hmm. to do things I, I, I think that's in this day and age I think that that's a very important step for us to take and not count on businesses to do it on their own. Totally agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I do as well, because I don't want another wave to come in and then we're still talking about ventilation, right? So if we, any, and I don't want to put an extra burden on, on the health department, but I don't know how, I just don't know how we can be proactive to keep this moving. Um, there's the financial piece to it, there's the research piece to it. So um, just would hate to be talking about this six months from now and nothing you know, has happened. I really think this needs to be a citywide project, yeah. not just the health department project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Should we put it up on the agenda for next month? Let's talk sure. about it again. Um, when we have some time to, to review some of the materials. Sure. Um, and um, Meredith, maybe I'll touch base with you after your meeting with the mayor and we'll sort of maybe come up with some kind of Am I frozen? Next step. Uh, oh, yes, you're better I'm, now. It, I, it would be nice if we could get a couple champions from the city council, you know, city councilors to work with on, mm -hmm. on this project with us. Um, so I'll check in. Okay, anything else? Hold on, there's a fire in my kitchen. One second. <laughs> Do 
We thought you were going to have dinner at eight. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I let the men cook. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, anything else before we adjourn? Oh, yes, I know. Um, we all want to know an update about our uh, potential um, board member. I have. I don't have an update for you. I haven't heard anything. I imagined once they got, once council did the two readings and they were sworn in, we would have heard, but I haven't heard anything. Okay. Can you check into that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Um, know who the nominee is? Yes, I don't. Um, I heard there was one. I cannot. Dallas Ducar, right? Is that the name? I cannot remember the last yep, name. That yep, sounds right. right. Sorry, what and is the name? Your, your impression is that they already went to city council and were approved? I thought so. Um, all right, well, well, we'll get an update for next time. Yep, maybe um, we'll be at our next meeting. Okay. Whenever um, someone is appointed, it would be very helpful to get a CV or res resume about that person so we can become familiar mm -hmm. with that person more easily. But really not a great opportunity to, to do that during a meeting. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, any, other, any other concerns, questions or concerns? Um, we want to talk about our next meeting. Right. Our, what? Did someone have a question? Uh, no. We we normally would meet next week, wouldn't we? So right, normally we're the third Thursday, so it would be next week, and the one after that would be April twenty first. Is there then, any is there any reason to meet before April twenty first? I don't think so. Any other thoughts? That would be nice. So, sorry, I was looking at my calendar. Uh, what was the question? So our regularly scheduled meetings are the third Thursday. Oh. So that would be next week. Question is, do we need to meet next week or should we go to the next scheduled meeting, which is April 21st? Um, I'm, unless there's a things we have not covered today and they're gonna to pop up, there's no reason to meet next week. We can always call a meeting if we need one. So we can go to the third week of April, yeah. Yep. Would be a nice good? break. Good for everybody? A bunch of non-COVID -to non topic related uh, yeah. <laughs> discussion. It will be spring by then. Mm -hmm. Yay. Um, is there a possibility to make contact with one of the person who had Good comments about um, ventilation and HVAC. One member of the public. I did, did offer to help. You mm -hmm. offered to help, and I hate to say, let's do nothing about it. We need to reach out. Joshua Yearsley. Yes, I have his name, but we he don't we don't know how to get in touch with him. And he's gone. We'll, we'll work on it. All Does right. Someone want to take that up as a task? Oh, I'm happy to try to track him. Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's scary. <laughs> How excited you got. <laughs> you have all that time not looking at the minutes. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Does anyone want to make a motion? Move to adjourn. Second. Well, this is awesome. It's all good news right now. Um, any comments? Uh, Meredith, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations on all you've accomplished and Thank you for your leadership through the past two years. My pleasure. Thank you. I agree. Totally. Time to take a five week vacation. <laughs> <laughs> you said five year. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All in favor of closing the meeting, Suzanne? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Lauren? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Thank you all so much.